Is everybody ready to go? Yeah, okay, so uh, once again, please, uh, course teaching and course evaluation up there when you're done, and the course learning over here. Um, thanks for uh, surviving the course. I hope you enjoyed it so far. Today is review day. Um, oh, and um, the other thing. I'll get, I'll get into some logistical stuff uh, when I talk about extra credit. First, I'm going to give you your bribes. And this is the last one. Now, anybody who has a peanut allergy, do not touch these things. They are cookies. You should have brought those out before we did the That's the lesson. So, these are the peanut butter, uh, raisin, uh, things, and there's, net, there's two trays of those, and on top of them I'm going to put some in foil, the walnut cranberry uh, date things. And there are fewer of the walnut cranberry date. We will see if there is actually an exchange uh, and trading going on later on. Um, I will let you guys decide the market price. Of course, it's based on uh, demand, which is based on taste. And I'm going, and, and there should be enough for one for everybody. So take one, and if there's extra, then the gluttons can go to town. So, and, and try and pry them out. I actually stuck, left them in the tray. You know? All right, and then pass these around. Now, if you don't want, go, go ahead. You don't feel, feel free to not eat. I ate them. I'm still alive, so they're good. Huh? No, oh, I made them. What are you talking about? I ground the flour. That went in these things. My, my landlord was like, you ground the flour? Whoa. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay, so, um, so I did not give you your bribes uh, before you did the evaluations for an obvious reason, right? I don't want to influence you unduly. But um, there is the notion that I could have passed it out and said, no, this should not influence you, right? That definitely is cheap talk. And so uh, I, I put my money where, or I put my cookies where my mouth is, uh, or whatever. And, and I excluded this from uh, uh, your contemplation in terms of course evaluation, which is not on my baking skills, but on my learning skills. So hopefully that will be uh, something good to eat, and the evals will be helpful for everybody who reads them. Um, is Jing here yet, Jing? Yeah, here's your regrade. And uh, somebody gave me a pen that I still, I don't know who the owner is. If they don't claim it right now, I'm keeping it. It's kind of nice. ASUC. Huh? <laughs> I don't want to know. Okay, I don't get it. Anybody? Pen? No? Okay, my property. So, um, you've got your bribes. Extra credit, just for clarification's sake, everybody who's working on these projects. Number one, everything has to be done before the final. Number two, if you do an extra credit project of any variety, I want it printed out and handed in on the final. There is one person who said, I've got to send you an audio recording file on email. That is acceptable. PowerPoint is, someone had some PowerPoint. I don't want to have 50 PowerPoint slides. So that's probably acceptable. But everything else should be printed out and turned in before the final. If you're contacting representatives, just as a clarification, you can con on the uh, ethanol question, you can contact up to two uh, representatives and two senators. You shall not contact 52 of them and then write down the two that respond to you. Okay? So you put your uh, uh, stick in the sand and say, I'm contacting these two, and that is your good or your bad luck as far as them coming back to you. And you should put it on the sheet yourself. Don't send me the names and say, I should put it on the sheet. I understand that you're sending me the names as confirmation in case some idiot decides to edit this away your, your uh, <coughs> property rights. But uh, you should add your names to the spreadsheet. Any other questions on? So if they don't reply, it doesn't count. They don't reply, it doesn't count. If they send you a form letter, it doesn't count. If they say, uh, I love penguins, that's not a form letter, but it still doesn't count. Okay? So I will look at the replies that you get and I will decide if you get between one and five points. If Senator Dianne Feinstein says, that's a great idea, I'm introducing legislation next week, then I will give you five points <laughs> for saving the world. And you will be world famous, moreover. Not just that. So intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Any other questions on the extra credit? No? Silence? That's peanut butter. You guys can't talk with peanut butter. Do it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so they have to reply before the final. 
Yeah, there's a deadline, unfortunately. Because I have to, I, seriously, seriously if, if they reply the day after the final and it's something awesome, send it to me. But I'm not, let's say it this way, I'm not guaranteeing any points for anything that happens after 5 p.m. on the, uh, what, 14th? 15th? 15th, okay. 15th is when we're taking the final. Everybody know the finals at 50 birds, right? Good. All right. Uh, how did the public goods games go in, dis in discussion last week? Somebody? Did it happen? Cookies left. Okay, seconds. Boy, lots. Okay, the department's going to be happy. Uh, do I have to leave this discussion here? So the, the thing that happened, yes. I have an interesting observation. Okay. Uh, so my group was really stingy during the first round, mm -hmm. but during the second round, everyone was doing the put in. Everyone was putting in their money into the group bid, uh -huh. into, the, into the group, so that everyone would get their share of the 200. Uh -huh. But our group decided that we would rather have someone in our individual group win over anyone else in the other groups. Uh -huh. So we were allowing the person who had, who had the most points from the previous round uh -huh. to keep their 50 and their individual one. So right. get the share of the 150 and then their yeah. 50. And it was funny because I had been stingy the, the entire time, the first time. Right. So of course I was into it. Because I had never put any points into the group pot. Right. Everyone else would do that. Right. And then they still let me do that. And decided okay, so wait. What, what happened is, there, the, let's, it was in, in two, phase one and phase two. Phase one is where there was, okay, I'll, I'll, but I want to go with your comment. Phase one was, uh, remind me, it was where everybody was, you didn't, didn't know who was in your group. You didn't know who was, you didn't know who was your group, so not. And then you had been free riding the whole time. Uh -huh. Okay. So you had the most points. Yes. And then uh, in the second phase, it was a, it was a, a, a known group, and I, I can't remember, was it, was it everybody scrambled up again? You were in new groups? Yeah. No. Okay, yeah. that was good, obviously, because otherwise people would have said no <coughs> way to say. No, you were in the same group as the first time. You were? No, you, you were. were. Yeah, I ran in the, the, in the same group. Yeah. Hold on, say again. In, in my section, they uh, they were in the same group as phase one. That was a mistake. Huh? It no. should have been scrambled and started again. <coughs> it should have been, in, thought, in phase one, you should have been in an anonymous group, you don't know who was there. Yeah. In phase two, you should have been resorted into new groups. Oh. Now, maybe I made the mistake designing well, it. Matter? Well, it can create, it can create what's called a path dependency, right? If everybody's been defecting in phase one, and they say, now you know who everybody you're working with, and they all defected last time, right? Then the, what happened in phase one would influence what happened in phase two. But we weren't supposed to show what happened in phase one. But everybody saw the group totals. It was on like the opposite side of the page. Uh -huh. yeah. so no, 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 no. You no saw one it? knew what your individual contributions were. But you knew how your group did. Yeah. Oh, okay, so oh, let's lay it this way. Maybe that was helpful. Maybe that was helpful, right? But then on your group, they basically said, uh, whoever has the most points, we're going to let free ride while we contribute so they can get the most points at the end of the session. Right? Yeah. So they're basically saying, we knew you were free riding before, and now we're going to reward you for it. Yeah. Right. Which is... Uh, very laudable, let's say, in terms of uh, yeah, sacrifice. But on the other hand, it was more like at least somebody in our group is going to get the three points compared to someone else. So in that sense, it kind of does work in terms of tribal survival, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Of. All right, so Faye nailed it. He exactly was thinking the right thing. That's okay. You could do it either way. I, I'm, I wasn't thinking that way. But what would happen, in, generally speaking, was there more free riding in phase one or in phase two? In phase one. Mostly, not because the incentives have changed, but because the mechanism of negotiation had changed. In a sense, you're looking at who's in your group and saying, either you're talking to each other, and you're using, it could be cheap talk, because you could say, you know, let's do this. And, and the decisions in, in phase two were still anonymous, uh, as in the people in your group did not see what you did, correct? Yeah? But you could actually talk with each other and say, can you please do this, right? And usually... People will do what they say they're going to do. Lying is much more difficult when it's face to face. Okay, this is an important, just a human thing. I put this on my blog last last week. You know, uh, 
ac academic research that is so obvious, then why are we doing it? Harvard Business School, surprisingly, or not, we're doing research showing that when people negotiate face-to-face, -face, they tend to be uh, more cooperative. So then you go from anonymous to known, and, and cooperation should go up, okay? And generally speaking, that was generically what happened, like on average. And until the last one, that was even more interesting. So everybody was cooperating all the way to the end, and then bang, it became a one-shot game, right? Apparently, sometimes it was not even spoken that it became a one-shot game, right? So that was interesting in terms of people's strategy. Okay, anybody still cookie? I'll pass these around a second time again, yeah. Uh, in a few minutes while you, when your hunger comes back. Um, any other observations from that? Yes, well, I'm not sure, that, that is, um, and in some ways it is a little bit um, uh, arbitrary, I think it was, the, I don't know if the word you used was arbitrary, but on the other hand, it was not nearly as arbitrary as the distribution of, of uh, valuations on the auction game, right, where some people literally came out the gate with a high valuation, and it made, them easy, it, made it easier for them to win. The, the, the mix of naughty versus nice or you or cooperator versus free rider that you were working with is not something that we can control or hope to control right but it, it could determine the outcomes but it was much more endogenous there was much more endogeneity especially in in round two in these public goods games um, as I mentioned before the economic uh, uh, prediction does not come true. The economic prediction is that everybody free rides. If you get a, a group of economists, that's what happens. But when you get a group of regular folks, or people that are in econ uh, like you guys, that understand the, the payoff and the trade-off, then there tends to be a lot more cooperation than zero. right? And one of the best uh, uh, versions of this game, which has been played hundreds if not thousands of times by academics, is when they took a bunch of folks, just say a group of everybody here, identified the free riders, put all the free riders in a group with each other, or groups with each other, and identify that you're in groups with free riders, and then what happened? Cooperated. They cooperated. They knew that they, their, their, um, their strategy depended on having cooperators around them to make money, right? But they all knew, they were all playing the strategy. Oh, good. Good job. Good job. Okay. There's more? There's still another tray. Finish that off. Take a little bit. The other tray will come around later. So um, that's one thing that we know from these, from these uh, public goods games. Yes? Well, I wonder actually if in phase one there was sort of a, a hump. If you got above that hump as a group, you would go and put in more as a group the next time. But right. Yes. But then, actually, my group, instead of going up, it just got less and less. Right. Because I think everybody figured, well, nobody put stuff in. So. Right. And that's because, in the end, a whole bunch of people end up being reciprocators. They look at what other people do. Not just in their group, but also what the other... Did anybody look at what the other groups were doing and change their behavior? Or just look? Did they change their behavior? No. Just maybe... Let's say that it has, it has some influence, potentially not on the margin. It may be a curiosity. The, I, I did some research um, and, uh, on public goods games that was um, a, a public goods game very similar to what you guys play. And the computer screen, this was all computer, it showed um, what you gave, what the group gave, and then... Um, on one version of it, it shows um, the average for not you, what everybody but you gave. Okay. Now, if you're doing, if you know these two pieces of information here, you can calculate this third thing here. 
right? And I, I actually did a version with only these two pieces of information. And how do you do it? You take the group, you subtract yourself, you divide by the group number minus one, okay? Then you can find that average. But one version I showed the average, and one version I did not show the average. And the thing that was interesting on this is that um, there was a massive switch in terms of the shares of free riders, reciprocators, and cooperators. When that information was shown, the number of reciprocators The number of reciprocators went up by a lot, right? It went up by almost 20, 20 points in terms of the share in the population. So the reciprocators, I think, was something like 60% of the population, and then it went to 80%, right? And essentially, reciprocators are the people that look at this kind of information, right? The information was implied in the first one, but here it was explicit. And so when it was explicit, the number of reciprocators went up. Now here's two, I thought, pretty interesting footnotes. Number one is that the average profits were identical, like within a point. And what that means in a sense is that if you had these two groups and they were actually competing, to me is what it means, this is called um, uh, something along the lines of evolutionary stability, uh, evolutionary stable strategy. ESS, anybody in ecology? Is that what that is? Evolutionary stable? Anyway. These two groups were actually almost identical in terms of their payoffs. And if you thought of that in terms of two tribes that were competing with each other in terms of who was going to survive, you could not pick a winner because their payoffs were almost identical. Does everybody understand that? Payoffs as a group. But here's the thing that blew my mind. That change, that swap, was almost entirely driven by women who were changing their behavior. And if you wanted to be generous with your explanation, you would say that women are the ones that balance out in different situations to keep the tribe alive, right? In the sense that they are changing their behavior to keep the, to keep the, the payoffs. They didn't even know what the other groups were doing, but they were much more responsive to the change in the dynamic in, in, in the environment. I, I look into the idea that girls can't do math, which is another uh, idea. That gets rejected, by the way. But uh, it was, I was, I, it was a very interesting, uh, and there's a, literally there's a branch of experimental economics called gender, right? And so I start, I wrote, the paper is like a nightmare in terms of not getting published, but the result is very interesting. And it was the girls that were switching uh, their behavior and essentially keeping an even keel for their tribe. So um, that's more information on how these public goods games are played out, and it's a very, very fertile area for research um, in terms of how we get along as folks. Any other comments or questions on that uh, class, that, that discussion section experience? Yes? This is interesting because like, if you're playing for something like three points, like, like I guess you want you're just assume that everyone like values that the same way and like or like wants those three points. So I don't know, like at least like my strategy is like could we call that? I don't know. I was like, well, I know I'm not supposed to put in fifty points each time, so I'm just gonna put in fifty points each time. Uh -huh. So like the groups, I guess I was probably like really beneficial to my group members, but like in terms of my returns, like I guess I got like a pleasant, happy feeling of right. feeling Warm fuzzies. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But like um but I guess like the second time through like um, but our group just was like, as a general, like for the first part, was significantly higher than like any of the other groups mm -hmm. in terms of like giving. And like, the second time around, I guess we did something similar that like your group did, and we just gave it to like whoever like needed the points and this kind of thing. Right. So, I don't know, I guess it's like, I just thought that was kind of interesting. No, it is interesting, and the, the whole point is to think about your interacting with other people, right? This is the whole group dynamic. And the um, uh, some people think that experiments are not necessarily useful, there's this called uh, external validity. Can you do stuff in the lab and then go and apply that outside? And they've actually done these lab experiments with civil servants in Indonesia, right, and students in Indonesia on corruption, right? It turns out that the students were more corrupt than the civil ser servants, right? They said, well wait, maybe it's just cheap talk, you're just doing it because it feels good. There's no real money at stake. They played these games when you put, when, when you have a week or a month of wages on the table. And people, especially in things like the trust game, people will leave a month of wages on the table rather than do the wrong thing.
okay? So these, these intrinsic motivations of people are very strong, when you put a, even when you put a wall of money as a motivation to defect. So and that be, in the sense, the behavior that you exhibit in these experiments tends to be behavior which is very similar to how you would work out in the real world. It's an ongoing fight between experimental economists and what are called field experimenters, but one way or the other we're getting insight onto how people interact and act. And those experimental results are influencing the academic, uh, the theoretical stuff that is presented in Econ 1, or it should, right? A lot of econ textbooks don't reflect this stuff and they give you this kind of autistic homo economicus who actually doesn't cooperate ever. That's one of the things, the points I've been making in this class. Yeah. Um, but would that somewhat change if you, like this play, the game is played with individuals who each have feelings of um, feel good, they want to be accepted and things like that. And what if you play it with big companies or corporations where it's the name of the company and nobody really feels that's me. Mm -hmm. And so like, let's say you have four power companies each putting into the public good, would mm -hmm. they act differently because there's... Well, uh, this is a point that a lot of people uh, miss, I think, that companies are also people, right? Now, you can have, what I mentioned l uh, last week, is that when you have two people that are monitoring on a punishment game, that they will actually say it's someone else's, it's his responsibility. No, it's his responsibility. So you could have that effect, you can recreate that effect very easily in the game with, with companies, companies being people. But if you put people in there and say, you individually represent Exxon, or whatever, then that person will take that personally, right? And in the real world, of course, they aren't uh, an individual, so you do see these kinds of, of, of passing the buck, placing the blame on someone else. But that doesn't mean that you can't, uh, you have to take that into account when you go back to the real world. And if you want to put individual responsibility on uh, big people and corporations, then you say, you are the face of this company. The way that they did with the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, where the CEO and the CFO would have to sign the financial documents personally guaranteeing that they were valid. Or they would go to jail, personally, right? This is the kind of thing that does make a difference. Another thing is that when all of the investment banks, they went from a partnership structure to a corporate structure, so Goldman Sachs went from partnerships to uh, uh, which means, in a partnership structure, if the company goes broke, you all lose your money, right? But corporate, they had, it's like, now I'm Goldman Sachs and you are my shareholders and don't worry, I'll take care of you guys, right? But when Goldman or Lehman, more importantly, goes bankrupt, then I keep my bonus and you guys are broke. And that creates a principal agent problem. Partnerships don't have that, that particular issue. Other stuff on this? Right. Questions and answers, anything, yeah. What's around about the um, like fourth point? Is that like the game that we Public made? goods game yeah. discussion, yeah. Um, I guess like, it, I don't know, it, it, I've been reading like articles about, um, like, because like, my research has been on like Indian tribes and like how they should like use their money. And I guess that's like, applied more than I thought it would because um, like I guess like, it, like it's um, like one of the authors like wrote about how like culturally influences like how people will like give money and like I know there's like um, like research done on like culture and how that influences like economic behavior at all like or like even a legitimate way of analyzing it because like it like the like the thesis was that like culture if like within the culture the tribe like legitimizes the the tribal council or whatever governing body it is then like public works projects are a lot more effective than like giving people individual payments and stuff? Yeah, well it depends on, I mean the, the way the culture, economists have avoided the word culture for a long time, mostly because you can't put it into the math. But, you know, when you have your utility function, and you can say it's a function of the stuff you consume, as reflected through this alpha parameter called culture, right, then, and you might, alpha might, let's just say this is what you consume, is what you consume, this is what, this is I, and then you could actually say, but what about what everybody else consumes, and then let's reflect that on a parameter called alpha. If you're in a collective type of culture, then this not I, the weight on not I is actually very strong, right? If you're in an individualistic culture, then the weight on not I is weak, and this is well understood, okay? So, Figuring out, the problem is, is that in homo economicus, we can ignore that, and that means we can do very simple math. But as soon as you bring in the idea that you might actually start to, to worry about other people, then the math falls apart. And so let's ignore that has been the solution for a long time. But that's wrong. You have to pay attention to people's attitudes towards other people. 
right? It's not necessarily altruism either, right? There's a certain warm fuzziness, how I feel personally, I don't even care about the other person. The, the way that people will donate money to international aid, I think I mentioned this before, they put the check in the envelope and then they're happy. They don't care if the check goes in the toilet, right? Or it's used for corrupt ends, you know, sex for food scandal type of things. So um, that's, you know, the kind of stuff that really does matter when you're doing research about how people interact. Yes, good. Um, I have a question, sorry, I was reading Shelling, and can you like clarify? You were reading Shelling? I was. Wow. Oh, hold on, I want to do a survey question. Hold that question. Who here read um, Frank? And, and this is like, we're all past evaluations, your course, you can be honest, I want to know. Who here liked Frank? Is Frank the green one? The, the green one, the economic naturalist. <laughs> the green book. Who read the Oh! <laughs> Who read the red book? Okay, what was, okay, put it down. Who, what was the second book called? Hazlitt. Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson. Who, led, who read Economics in One Lesson? Who, who, okay, let's do it the other way around. Who didn't read Economics in One Lesson? Okay, that's okay. I just want to know. And who, who read it, who read it and liked it? Who read it and didn't like it? Okay, good. And then Olson. Who read Olson? Who didn't read Olson? Who read Olson and liked it? Oh, wow. <laughs> Who made it to the end, right? Who read Olson and didn't like it? Uh, okay. And then, uh, so you're still, you, you have read it, of course. Shelling. Shelling. Who read Shelling? Reading it? Cram time. Who intends to read Shelling? <laughs> Who intends to ace the final? All right, all right. All right. <laughs> Sorry, so shall I? Uh, uh, yeah. I just wanted to clarify what you meant by like, conservative quantity and semi closed systems. Oh, of course. What the hell? Let me see. That was <laughs> Sorry about like, ski lifts and. Ski um, lifts? Ski lifts? <coughs> yeah, how like you buy it. Are, are, uh huh. Yeah, so. Like, um, yeah. so um, it makes things slower <laughs> by adding like. Yeah, so the idea of having a, a closed system, um, and he has a ski lift example in this, and this is my, I'm going to give you my, my brief idea, so I could be wrong, right? So that you have a ski lift, and um, the people are going to go up, let's say A are going to go up, and B are going to come down, okay? A will equal B on a ski lift system. That is a closed loop, right? If you have um, people helicoptering in, or people going off on some other trail, this is the ski analogy, right? Then A will not equal B. So you have to worry about uh, uh, accounting for where people go. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what his point is. It might be that there's noise in, in the system. Because he mentioned that people always say, like, oh, can't they make that let's go faster, but that would actually make everyone go slower. Oh, I know. This is this crazy. I mean, it's like it hurts your head to think about that. Yeah. So, if you make the lifts go faster, then everybody's going to show up here at, at once, but they all have to come back down again, right? So you can never run faster than people are coming and going going down the hill. So in that sense, the ski lifts speeding up the ski lifts. Oh, that's right. So if you're speeding up the ski lift, you still have to get everybody back down again before they can get on ski lift, right? So and there might be a, a line here. If you slow down the ski lift, there'll be a line. If you speed it up, there won't be any line. Right? So that's kind of, I think, what's going on. Yeah. The book's main purpose is just a discussion of like, dynamics, though, right? Because it yeah. feels like it's a lot of rambling. Just for he's a rambling guy. And, and it's, you know, the, the, he's one of those non-math guys who's not concise, but he discusses a lot of stuff and he makes you think about it. And this is the kind of stuff that you can't do with shelling. You can't mathematize shelling. Right? He was very famous in a, uh, for, for coming up with the co concept of a focal point. Right? A focal point, for example, is that um, if I tell you guys, we're going to have the final somewhere on campus, not 50 uh, whatever, and not this classroom. And it's going to be at 5 o'clock on the 15th, but I'm not going to tell you where it is. But it's going to be where we all are going to meet. <coughs> <laughs> right? Where, if you had to meet somebody, or this is the, the generic idea, if you had to meet someone on campus, but you didn't know where you were going to meet them, but you knew when, and you knew that they knew that you were trying to figure out where they're going, and that you're trying to figure out where they're going, because they know that you, you, they're both from 
UC Berkeley, where would you meet? Where would we have the final exam? Now think about it for a second. And then I want five hands up before I... Uh, you can ask a question, yeah. Um, so we can't be here. No, not here and not the place, the official place. There's a hand, hold on. I need five opinions. Oh, a question. A question, go ahead. Can we communicate with... No, no, you can't. You don't have cell phones anymore. One, two, three, okay. So where? Sprout. Sprout. Outside this building. Outside this building, nice try. Sprout. Sprout. Outside this building. Okay. Southern Gate. Southern Gate. I was thinking in the middle. The middle. What's the middle? <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually, there's, so there is no focal point. There is a coordination problem. I was actually thinking the Campanile. Yeah, me, too. me too. See, you guys are right. A, A, A. Oh, so, but a focal point, and he gave the example, you've got to meet somebody on a New Year's Day in New York City, where would you go, right? A focal point in that instance was, people would say Times Square, which is a mess, right? Or um, the clock at Grand Central Station, right? These tend to be focal points. It's not 42nd and... Uh, whatever, Broadway, I don't even know if those two cross, right? So focal points are kind of a place where people, you, you think, where would I go and where would you go? And if you know that I'm going there, would I go? You see what I'm saying, right? And it can be very imperfect, given that we would have had a, a problem with the final. Um, but that's the idea that Schelling came up with. Now, the reason I gave this example is, number one, you should pay attention to the idea of a focal point, but number two, you can't do math to figure out a focal point. It's just this huge mess called I'm trying to think of what everybody's thinking. There's no math involved. And this is a thing that Schelling specializes in, these social dynamics, right? Um, so thinking, the book is to have you think about things. It might make your head hurt, right? But that's the idea. Yeah. Well, maybe it think it's it. just like the whole 50 people who are here and then 80 people are there, and like the whole back and forth thing. Right. Yeah, it is a little bit rambling because he's just, I mean, the problem with the book is that you can just keep typing away. But, um, you know, sometimes it does deserve a longer discussion. Sometimes the discussion is too long. Sometimes it's too short. Other questions? Can I ask you a question about that, um, the rival, and then... Yeah, this is on the exam. What's the, like, what, what's the difference between a club and a pub? And why is one... Club like, good, club? public good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Free as in beer. Any other questions? We have these pubs. Any other questions? Can we have essay questions? No, the final exam is uh, 16 true-false questions, none of which have been written by me. And then uh, seven or eight, or six or eight, uh, long questions that are similar to your homework questions. Calculating, writing down, mathematical type of stuff. Very similar to the midterm. Yeah? No blue books. We're going to give you the paper. And you'll have plenty of time, right? Because there's three hours. This class session is 80 minutes. That's 180 minutes. And it's only going to be 50% longer, right? Other questions? What's in my top left box? This is a private good. An apple. A can of Coke. Behavioral economics is essentially uh, psychology relabeled as economics, um, and it has to do with, um, let's see, so they have, experimental economics means doing experiments, and which is using the experimental method, the scientific method, right? You can reproduce the experiment over and over again. Uh, behavioral economics has to do with... Um, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of strange just to say it's just like psychology, but, um, you know, um, uh, Kahneman, <coughs> Kahneman, I think that's the right spelling, I'm just giving it a Germanic thing, and Tversky, these guys um, won the Nobel Prize, well, uh, I think Tversky was dead, you can't win it when you're dead. But Kahneman and Tversky did research on uh, what was called risk aversion. 
that is something that I mentioned to you guys before, right? That there's, there's risk neutrality, there's risk aversion, and there's risk seeking. But what they found um, is that when you were looking at a win, you had essentially like a, a typical utility function in terms of your utility from a payoff of x. But then when you were looking at a loss, um, it tended to be more dramatic, right? The whole, it's called, it's in a sense, risk aversion is driven by loss aversion, right? So that your, your utility from, this is, the, this is the loss here, minus x. And this is, let's say it's an equal win here, or let's be really dramatic. This minus x here. And you have a, an equal win. So the, the utility of x compared to the disutility of minus x, the disutility of minus x is much greater, right? If you have this kind of shape of preferences, you are risk averse, right? Because you have a heavier weight of disutility on losses. This is the kind of thing, when I, and this is like, this is the kind of thing I would have on the final. Because this is what loss, this is the risk aversion, what it means in terms of the definition. Um, do we need to be able to identify like which situation is a complete information and which one is incomplete information? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. Man. And then the incomplete one is when the player doesn't know the other person's action or the other person's payoffs. Um. Let's see, there's imperfect, help me out, I don't even remember. What, imperfect, in, complete information? Perfect. Yeah, complete versus perfect. I think complete, you know, you know the payoffs, right? Is that right? Yeah. Payoff. And then uh, perfect, you know the moves. Is that right? Yeah. You know the payoffs too, imperfect information? Uh, not necessarily. <coughs> right, you can have incomplete and perfect. Then do you know your own payoffs? Imperfect and perfect? No, you only know your moves. You may not know the payoffs. Oh. So for like it's another two by two. For like a poker game, would that be like a complete because you know, like the pot that's in the middle, like you know how much you're going to be getting? Or is it also... You have to know the payoffs from a given action. <laughs> in order to know the complete payoffs, right? Okay. So, uh, oh, but yeah, you're right, because you don't know what the moves are. No, but it's not complete, because you don't know what hands people hold, either. I'm not quite sure what poker would be. It probably is incomplete and imperfect. It's probably bad, in that sense. Yeah. Is Prisoner's Dilemma complete and perfect? The Prisoner's Dilemma is complete and imperfect, because you don't know what the other person does as a move. Oh. In the example you gave with the Princess Bride, the short man had uh, complete information, but he didn't have perfect information, right? He had, he de yeah, he didn't have perfect, and he also didn't have complete. He thought he was playing a game where there was one poison and one not. But, but he, he was playing the game. Out. He knows if he doesn't drink the poison, he's going he's gonna to get off of the girl. In that sense, you have a thing? Yeah, what? Um, he doesn't know the payoff of the other guy. It's for the other guy who thinks that if he drinks the poison, he dies. If he doesn't, then he doesn't. But, uh, That's he true. That's true. He doesn't know the payoffs of the other guy either. Right? Know that if the other guy drinks the poison, he's not going to die. He doesn't know that, right? He thinks that if he drinks the poison, he'll die, right? So he thought there was one set of payoffs. There was not. That was not true. So it was incomplete. And even worse, he didn't know, he thought it, he had imperfect information because he thought he only put the poison in one flask and he put it in both. So, you know, Sicilians shouldn't play these games. Incomplete, imperfect. Hold on, now there's someone else. Anyone else? Yes. Can you go over the actual definition of risk aversion? The actual definition of risk aversion <laughs> is that. that over either one. Sorry? Or explain that over either one. Explain this over? Okay. Essentially, yes. Risk aversion, Here's, I'll give you the math and I'll talk about it. Okay, so it means that the utility from a loss is 
uh, the, or the disutility from a loss is greater than the utility from a win of the same amount x. Okay. So essentially, if if you have a chance of winning a dollar, if I have a coin here, I'm flipping a coin, and you have a chance of winning a dollar or losing a dollar, if you're risk averse, you're not going to want to make that bet relative to not playing the game at all, right? Not playing the game at all, you have a payoff of zero, right? If it's a 50-50 chance, the expected payoff <coughs> under the coin flip is zero, 50% a dollar, 50% not a dollar, right? So because your disutility from loss is greater than your utility from winning, the, the expected win is zero, but your expected utility is less than zero. If you're risk neutral, your expected utility is equal to zero because these are equal to each other. If you're, that would mean that you would have this shape, right? That they're symmetric. You could draw a straight line if you want to, okay? But they're, they would be symmetric, that's the key. Does that answer your question? Okay, other things, other questions? Hold on, anybody else? You had 12. Yeah, you had 12 too. Anybody else have a question? Mm. Mm, okay. Well, I just want to say about the poker game. Yeah. I think that'd be incomplete because the, there are a lot of odds when you play poker that like, really get into it. Yeah. Everybody knows. No, I think poker is incomplete and perfect. Yeah. I think. I mean, I'm ready to be persuaded otherwise, but I think you don't know the payoffs because um, you don't know where you are in the game. No. No, you do. Know, you could calculate everything, but you don't know what the hands are. Most of, like most professionals know all the odds. Yeah, I those are the payoffs in a sense. Um, it's like a expected payoff. So I'm, I would get that that would make it complete. Well, well, they know their own odds, but they don't. Know. Well, what they do is they guess the cards of the other person. And they but that's the perfect. Card. That's imperfect but complete. What that complete though is. Well, they, they're not sure what the other ones are. They know what the, they know what the tree is. They just don't know where they are on the tree. So this is complete. They know what the tree is, but they don't know where they are on the tree. <coughs> think about it, but, but in I, let's just take that as my opinion right now, but I think it's right. I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise. Other hand, yeah. Why? Because you don't know what you're going to call it. I mean, you could guess what you're going to do. If you're talking about strictly payoffs. Yeah. You could see what's in the pot, but I mean, you make that. You don't know what they're going to do. So you have no idea what the payoffs are going to be worth. That's why you're always going in your head and seeing it. No, but that's imperfect. You don't know their moves. But the, when you're, in terms of payoffs, you mean how much money you're going to win or lose. How much money you're going to win that's in the pot, right? Um. Yeah, I mean, you know... You, you know you know what the pay what the payoff tree you know what the what the moves that are possible are you just don't know where you are on that tree right so the problem your your uncertainty in poker comes from not knowing what people are doing right if you saw if everybody's cards were on the table and you're playing poker you would know exactly what to do and what they were doing right so I think the problem is, is not knowing their moves, which includes the cards they're given. Nature is playing in here, too. Nature's throwing the random stuff out there. So you don't know nature moves either. But if you see the cards on the table, there is no doubt about what's going on. Right? So you have complete information. But when your hands are in your, in, when, you're, when you're holding your cards, you have imperfect information also. Okay, sorry. Another hand. Yeah. Sorry, going back to the risk graph, was the... Was it symmetrical for risk averse or risk neutral? Risk neutral. Okay. It's asymmetric for risk averse and with a heavier weight on losses. If you're risk seeking, there's a heavier weight on uh, wind. wins, right. Okay, now, our, our popular two. Do you have a question still? Uh, actually, it was just answered. Ah, see? That was awesome. Okay, yes. Um, for the risk aversion graph, which one is it? Because it has two tails on the negative side. Which one? No, 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 no. I just drew another tail. It's a different tail. It's not two tails. Oh. Why doesn't it concave up when it's negative? Like, wouldn't it? Because then the rate of decrease would be greater? 
It's just, it's just meant to be symmetric. <laughs> just like that. That's symmetric. Okay? If you put a greater weight, if you have a shape like this, this is risk averse. And if you have a shape like this, that's risk seeking. <coughs> That's what I'm, that's my point. Those are the three types. So there is no inflection point? The inflection point is a zero, but not here. This is risk neutral. Inflection point is when you change from one to the other. Right. But for the seeking one, doesn't it just, isn't it the same from... No, it's the opposite of risk reverse. No, 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 I mean the, the concavity from... I have no idea what concavity is. What? Okay, the inflection point is when like the concavity changes. Right. Right, but for seeking, it's the same from negative to positive. Right? No, no, no. This is meant to be like this, and this is go, and it's and this and if this was a smooth curve. Oh wait, I see what you're saying. So you're saying it's actually just smooth like that. Yeah. Oh, let's let do it against this against this point here. Think about it like that. So this is actually, no, it's not, it's, it, there is an inflection point. I just grew up out of it. Draw it back. line here, it would be like that. So there's an inflection point there. This is risk seeking, right? Downside risk is not as bad of a disutility as upside utility from wind. Okay, okay time for cookies phase two. Other questions? You're stretching, okay. Do you have a question? What are the actual definitions? Like, the actual definitions? Like, what is risk seeking? Like, what do you, how do you qualify as risk seeking? If you qualify as risk seeking, if, like I said with the utility function definition, then, right? Your utility of negative x, which is going to be negative, right? Plus utility of positive x is less than zero. That's risk averse. So if you take a risk and then you lose and your dissatisfaction is greater than what you would have been like gained from, yeah. then that's risk averse. Yeah. Oh. yeah. That's what I said before about the coin flip, right? You your expected expected payoff from a one a plus a dollar minus a dollar, your expected x is equal to zero. <coughs> right? But you're, if you are risk averse, your expected utility of x is less than zero. Okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. And then you can you can use this would be if it was equal to zero, it would be what? Neutral. Risk neutral. And if it's greater than zero, seeking. you're seeking. Awesome. Okay. A different question besides poker and risks, or not? Yeah. Um, when you're talking about incomplete context, what are you saying about the change in surplus? Destroying more surplus than the initial deal can be modified in contract. Whoa. I don't know. What was I saying? Incomplete. Con I can start with incomplete contracts, and we can see where I, I get to what you're talking about. Is that the idea? Mm -hmm. Tell me about incomplete contracts. Okay. So I 
We're talking about strand, uh, stranded assets, that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, that. I mean, I know what it, I know what it means to get contact with, but I don't know what the point was. Well, the point of incomplete contracts, if you have a contract, you've got point one, point two, blah, 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 right? Because of information problems, not action problems, but because of information problems, you can never specify every action at every point in time, right? Let alone that you might have a problem with knowing what happens. But let's just say you can't even specify every action at every point in time, okay? So, you know, um, you and I make a deal. I hire you to serve coffee at my restaurant, okay? And you're serving coffee and you're getting paid a wage. That's the contract. Then the restaurant catches on fire. And I say, take care of the fire, I'm leaving. Right? That's not specified in the contract. There's an incomplete contract. You're going to be like, wait, I'm going to do whatever I feel is right. Because I have no, I have no, nothing to affect me in my contract in terms of my action <laughs> under conditions of fire. Right? So you default back to what's in my best self-interest. Now it could mean I love putting out fires because I'm a firefighter, or it could mean get the fuck out of here, right? So that would be a problem with incomplete contract, okay? Now, and, and we know that contracts, you can never write complete contracts, right? I got into one that was a little bit, it was not an incomplete contract. I sold, I was on <coughs> eBay selling something, someone bought it, you win, and then they didn't pay me, right? Now. I said, you, they, eBay says, go through the adjudication process, wait for five days, be really nice, send it to our committee of not doing anything. I'm like, screw that. So I sent it off a second price offer to someone else who did not do anything. They didn't accept the offer. So then I'm like, well, I didn't sell it, and, and I have a friend who wants to buy it. And I sent her an email, you want to buy it? Bang, yes. Should have done that in the first place, right? But now eBay might come after me and say, you said you promised you would sell it to so-and-so, the flake. And now we're getting into disputes, right? So who knows where that's going to go? Personally, I'm just going to ignore it and move on, right? But that was, in a sense, a complete contract that I actually just went away from, thinking that the contract is BS. I don't want to deal with that. Because the contract defends eBay. It doesn't defend me. But you have to figure out what to do when people go, essentially, out of equilibrium behavior, right, on, on what you would prefer. Now, the whole idea of a stranded asset in terms of a strategic game, is that you have the railroad track and it goes to the mine, which is otherwise known as a big hole in the ground. And there's the first step, which is you have a mine and no tracks, right? And there's Mr. A and Mr. B. Mr. A says, um, this mine is not worth very much unless I start shipping away my ore, and says to Mr. B, I'd like to make a deal with you. Would you invest a huge amount of fixed cost and then uh, have an operating marginal cost so that I will pay you an average cost, uh, some price, uh, less than price, right, so you get some profit, based on a certain specific specification of quantity. So they make a deal, right? This, in fact, is a complete contract as far as I build a railroad, I ship out your stuff, you pay me money, right? Now, the problem is, in terms of just pure game theory, is that before the railroad is built, B has lots of negotiating power called, I will take your deal or not. After the railroad is built, Right? B has incurred the fixed cost. That's a sunk cost now, right? And B has much less negotiating power. Does that, does that make sense? Last one? Yeah. You want a cookie? No. Okay, hold on a second. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So, what you, this is a hold up problem. So, the <coughs> railroad builds, and then Mr. A says, hey, you know what? I think we should renegotiate our contract. I will pay you P less than P star. Right? Now, there were some people in the class who said, but wait a second. Now, <coughs> B is screwed in terms of the track, or sorry, 
uh, A is screwed in terms of not having a mind that's right. But as, as I mentioned, A could just leave the or in the mind. It was already there, right? But B has gone into debt, let's say, to pay those fixed costs. So that's why B is more screwed than A in that ex post renegotiation. Does that help? Yeah. Is there more? Um, I just want to think about the surplus side. The surplus? Yeah. About what? Um, when you were talking about like, the painting example, if you want someone to paint the first door and then you say paint the first door, were you saying that? Paint? <coughs> yeah, the painter, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, go ahead. Were you just saying that that like, takes away some consumer surplus because they would pay more for that with downstairs? Um, give me more about the example. Well, that was it. That was it. Yeah. Let's talk about painting. Mr. A paints downstairs in Mr. B's house, and Mr. B asked him to also take wood in the upstairs. Okay, kind of changing the contract in the middle of it. And it takes away consumer surplus because of what? Um, because you can charge more for the other room, but they can charge more services. Mm, I don't know if that's. Okay. Throw out that example. Don't use that example. Or whatever you think it is, because I'm not sure what it is. Can you talk about a mechanic too? Like, you can bring the car to the mechanic and say, fix the light. Right. And then he goes in and he goes, alright, you also need to defend you. Mm -hmm. And I'll charge you this much. And like, not, that's not an incomplete contract problem. That's an asymmetric information problem, principal agent problem. Yeah, that's principal agent. Okay, yes. So we can never have a complete contract. Basically, yes. Do you need to know the lecture of the guest lecture of the Netherlands? Yes. What? <laughs> <laughs> we need to know what was in the guest lecture by Thies, oh. the Dutch guy. <clears throat> oh shit. Yeah, it's on video, don't worry. <laughs> Go ahead, 30 hours of video. Woo! Uh, and it, I think you guys saw the, the transcription note. I, it's kind of, you can watch the, the lectures in, in Persian and Russian and all kinds of stuff. The transcription, not that it's Brenna's problem, but the technology is not exactly synchronized. So the words kind of, they show up early, they show up late, whatever. But uh, it is quite entertaining to watch the subtitles go by. Any other questions? Every so often, if you like swear, you're just like imagine it like talking about it. I don't know what's going to happen to the swear words. It's interesting. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> Although you, did you type in the swear words? Often, right? <laughs> I said, hey, it's high fidelity. Any others? Yeah. Do you still have office hours this week? Oh, yeah, office hours. Not today. And, oh, so yeah, that was two questions. So, uh, my schedule is really horrible this week. Um, and Diane, is Diana still here? Are you, you're, out of, you're not having any office hours. You're clear, right? Between now and the final? Yes. Okay, so Diana's not doing anything. Faye is doing what? Um, I am doing my regular office hours, Wednesday and Friday, and also an extra office hour next Monday. Okay, you guys know that. So the extra office hour Monday when? Uh, two to four. I sent an email, actually, to everybody. Sorry? I sent an email to everybody. You sent an email, that's yeah. right. Just in case people aren't paying attention. Um, Monday is the 14th, the day before the final. Right on. Um, uh, okay, I have, uh, I can do um, either office hours, I can do office hours <coughs> and a review session, or just office hours, or just review session. And I don't, I, the timing is a, of interest. So, you're doing this thing on Monday, right? Right. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I if if I think a review session closer to the final is often better. Does do people want to do a review session? Number one, a review session, yes or no? Yes. Okay, that would be yes. And on Monday or on Tuesday? Monday. Tuesday. Last minute, people. Okay. The final. The day of the final. No, on the final. No, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's the answer to question two? No. Okay, it's Monday. Now, Faye is doing something from two to four. Yeah. Um, Sunday, I have just worked Sunday. I'm not working two Sundays in a row. 
So how about, uh, although I am working, but not on your stuff. So Monday at uh, 4 p.m. We have, to, okay, let's do this. I'm not going to be in, uh, doing a review session. I'm, I'm assuming one hour or two hours. <laughs> Any surprise there? Okay, so we've got a choice. We've got uh, 4 p.m., which is after phase, or we have, uh, let's just say, uh, 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? 10 a.m., say yay. 4 p.m., say yay. Whoa. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> oh, and I have to get a room, though. I have to get a room. This is a problem, because I can't get this room, necessarily. Huh? Someone's department or apartment? Yeah. Beer. <laughs> we should run beer. That'd be awesome. BYOB. It'll be a BYOB review session. <laughs> I don't even want to know about your licenses. Um, so is there any other suggestion from the floor on a Monday time that's better than these two? Well, I'm swimming at 12. <laughs> oh, who thinks 12? Yeah, see, forget it. <laughs> Everybody's swimming at 12. Okay. Uh, hardcore, 10 o'clock if you're serious. Only get to vote for one. 4 o'clock. All right, 4 o'clock. Who can't, who can't make 4 o'clock? Why? Why? Do you have a final? Four. Four, whatever. <laughs> Another review session. Another review session. Should we move it to five? Five to seven? Is that better? No. no. Worse? Five. Five. Yeah. There's a final of five. So four is better. Yeah. Okay. Hey? This is last minute called I was reviewing it and I have no idea about this. This is what it is. If you start studying after 4 p.m., then that's probably okay. I don't know. I know the material. Is this the same stuff that Diana did? This is whatever. I'm going to show up and you guys are going to ask me questions. Oh. I am not leading anything. I'm going to show up and talk shit. <laughs> or not. <laughs> shit, but it's relevant shit. On the final. You can ask, oh, is this on the final? I'll say, I don't know because I've already written the questions. Okay. Oh, and, and so office hours. I can do office hours on um, Thursday morning this week. At, is anybody 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock? Good or no? Does anybody care? If you care, raise your hand. 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on Thursday, I'll have office hours. Any other questions? Yeah. What? What evaluations? Briefings. The briefings will come back at the final. Yeah. Your homeworks are back. Uh, your grades will be uploaded, etc. Okay, great. See you guys.